did and was to try to see how could you design something on ecosystem-based principles. And I think in a lot of ways that was really successful. So we look at feedback effects among ecosystem components. It uh, looks at ecosystem boundaries versus management boundaries and stock boundaries. How do those differ? How do those interact? What are the implications of maybe managing something at a different boundary than, than, the, uh, than the appropriate ecosystem or stock boundary? Is that a risk? Um, looks, bring, tries to bring in the human dimensions of ecosystems. That's something that I know we could improve on a lot more, but certainly we tried in the, as a starting point to look at communities in the area and then different user groups in the area. Um, it, uh, we tried as a team to come up with ideal and proxy indicators. So if we had all the information, what would we want to be tracking? But given that we don't necessarily have the money and the research to, to go after those indicators right now, what could we try to use instead and what would be useful? And then uh, it, as I say er, earlier, to suggest priorities and considerations for the council to mitigate risk. One of the big challenges is, so we've got this great document with a lot of information, what do we do with it now? Um, certainly, we, as I said, we want the FEP to be a living document, so to try to update that, but I think the next big step is trying to figure out how do you integrate um, this, this great ecosystem context it actually into your management actions more than just as an informational document, and that's uh, something that I think we're still working on. As I say it's pretty early days of, of using the document. Um, certainly, the council, as part of the the annual ecosystem report to the council that comes uh, at harvest specifications. They're getting updates on these indicators, but how do we make this a little bit more, more relevant and, and integrate it with what we're doing? And in terms of regulatory obstacles, the, we, one of the things that we talk about um, in the harvest specification process is it's a pretty time impact pro impacted process from the time you get your information to the time you got to start a fishery on that new data. How do you insert an ecosystem step into that process is one of the things that we've been struggling with that was highlighted in the FEP as an issue. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna skip really quickly through um, a couple of other things here, uh, sort of other tools that we use at a management level. I think we've maybe mentioned yesterday a little bit about NEPA, maybe Anne talked about it. Um, the NEPA requires certain analytical requirements. I think that's been helpful as a tool for uh, ecosystem-based management because um, it does provide the, uh, there, the NIMPS had a lot of lawsuits in the late 1990s and or in early 2000s and it, it created this a craze for educating people about the requirements of NEPA and how best to meet these analytical requirements. A lot of the great things about NEPA are is that, that it does ask you to look at this comprehensive um, impacts of what you're doing. So I think in, in Jake's terms, the full footprint of your direct fishery impacts. And, and we had training not just for staff and council members, but we also had training for stakeholders during part of that process to educate people about what are the, what are the best practices that we're trying to meet when you see um, management actions come through the council. In that way, uh, I think it's, it's effective having checklists, having tools for analysts is a very effective method for getting people to think about maybe the range of, of uh, Im possible impacts from a management action that you're looking at. And certainly being transparent about the things that you're considering putting into a decision is always a great thing. Um, any of you who know my boss, Chris Oliver, will know that he hears the word NEPA and shrinks up in horror. Um, <laughs> mainly because there's uh, a lot of people who uh, will take the NEPA requirements and think that that means you need to throw the cut and paste the kitchen sink into an analysis. And that's not the object of decision making. The ob object of, of any analysis is to inform decision makers about what they need to know in order to understand an analysis. And so I think trying to find that balance between uh, a comprehensive requirement and uh, uh, something that's actually useful is something that we're still trying to struggle with at a council level and probably at a national level. The uh, council also has an ecosystem committee, uh, various uh, different membership um, tasked with giving the council advice on ecosystem issues and they've been involved in some of the recent projects, particularly um, AIFEP and the Alaska Marine Ecosystem Forum that I've just talked about. Um, I think having a policy advisory group um, on ecosystem issues is really helpful. Um, to have that focus uh, to provide advice to the council. One of the, the obstacles to its effectiveness maybe, um, we used to have one of our members used to be a council member and so we had that direct voice to a decision making at the council level. Um, that person is no longer on the council. I think that's certainly, um, doesn't mean the committee doesn't still have use but it's, it was maybe a little stronger when we had the council member on the committee. And, um, 
there's also a question of, of whether or not this is definitely a policy advisory group. Um, is it useful or appropriate to have a, a purely scientific advisory group, or does the SSC fulfill that function? Which, in a lot of ways, it does. But the SSC has a pretty big laundry list of scientific advice um, that it, it requirements that it needs to give to the council. So um, that's a question. Uh, just briefly, finally, on the Arctic FMP, um, the council recently adopted an Arctic FMP. There was a prior, previously no fishing in the no fishing fishery management plan in the Arctic, and again, because of changing climate conditions, it seemed an opportunity to, if there are a changing distribution of fish, if people want to go out fish up there, we should have a structure in place. One of the really exciting things, I think, from ecosystem-based management for, for perspective, is starting out afresh. So here we had this opportunity. We didn't have a fishery management plan in place, and we could design it based on and try to really incorporate some of those ecosystem-based ideas. Um, certainly, the uh, the FMP itself doesn't allow fishing at the moment, but it uh, provides a mechanism for how would you design. Um, uh, how would you allow fishing? What are some of the ecosystem-based principles? It's a comprehensive plan that looks at look, all components of the ecosystems, and it takes some of those lessons from the ground fish programmatic, from the FEP, and tries to build them into the development of that FMP, which was really effective. Starting from uh, from scratch with a new area is, is a lot makes it, uh, a lot easier to try to incorporate those principles rather than add them on afterwards. Uh, some of the obstacles uh, that I think some of the other uh, Pacific Council had as well, but again, following those, those regulatory barriers, it's, it's difficult to have um, a, an FMP that doesn't allow fishing. Um, and uh, the, the rule structure isn't set up for that. So that was some of the legal challenges that had to be worked out when we were trying to do the FMP. So this just gives you a, a visual of some of the things that I've talked about over time, showing that um, going back to the idea of, of the ecosystem-based fishery management baseline changing over time, um, you can see that uh, as things were added on, I think that that does happen. All of a sudden, you know, more is expected of uh, of decision makers, staff, and stakeholders in understanding what a best practice for a management system is. Um, these are just some of the tools that I've talked about. And then in terms of conclusions, I think that the main conclusion is if you, if you have an interest, or certainly as a council body has an interest in looking at ecosystem-based managements, despite regulatory boundaries, despite mandates or unfunded mandates, that there's still ways to move forward. And, and I think that we, we have evidence of that at our council. Um, but I think the key way that it's going to be successful is that it has to be a slow process. And the reason it has to be slow is because you have to involve both decision makers and stakeholders. And if you have your stakeholder base agreeing with your um, understanding and supporting your, your move towards some of these best practices, even if they are um, maybe you know, facing, you know, in terms of the fishing industry, facing a hit in the pocket, I think you're going to have a lot more support if people understand where you're going and understand that there's a long-term view and, and how that all fits together. Um, and I think that's uh, pretty critical to trying to get, in, get that, that stakeholder buy-in um, into uh, moving forward. And the, yes, exactly, the shifting your baseline, I think, is important. You need to be looking at now and trying to look forward of, of you always want to be improving your management program. Um, it's not helpful to say it's great to get credit for looking back, but realistically, your goal is always to try to improve and move forward and see what you're doing. Thank you. Totally agree. I think the same idea is so that the idea is you try to understand the context first before you make your individual management decision. It's the same principle that we used with the FEP as well, is to try to find a way to try to understand what's going on in the ecosystem and then use that as a context, as a basis when you're making your individual management decisions. That's a great approach. I think there's always room for trying to, you know, trying to improve your approach, but I, I agree that that is a, a, an important consideration. Maybe one more? Sounds like a very exciting opportunity. Uh, I'm just 
wondering, uh, in Camelot, the, having such large closed areas it, it is used as a way of learning about how to manage fisheries and how to manage other things. And as part of that learning process, what the benefits of open and closed mosaics might provide to fisheries. My question is, is, is there an interest nationally to use this opportunity to try to provide uh, information and knowledge relevant to other areas in the US uh, in how to That's an interesting question. I'm not sure. I think certainly the idea of uh, being able to use, um, you know, open and closed areas in a larger closed area is something that uh, a project that I didn't talk about, but uh, the Northern Bering Sea Research Area, which is the northern part of the Bering Sea, was recently closed to fishing. It's an area that wasn't used much by 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 fisheries, close to non-pelagic trawl fishing, bottom trawl fishing, um, but with the express purpose of that same idea that you're talking about, trying to do. I see, I'm getting into the habit of, I want to say adaptive management, but it's not adaptive management, but doing some kind of closed and open area experiments to try to see what, uh, what some of those, those practices that you would need. Um, I, I don't know that I've heard of a national discussion um, trying to use the Arctic to, to use those lessons elsewhere, but I would certainly think that's a, that's a possibility and, uh, and other people might have talked about that. <laughs> 